Today's message from Rev. Christian Sorensen was recorded September 25th, 2016, and it's titled, What Slide Are You Looking Through? Subtitled, Change Your Slide and Feel the Weight Lifted. You Can Now Breathe. Open musical artist today was Tanya McKenna. Come visit us at SeasideCenter.org or join us in Encinitas, California sometime, where always we have great music, as you can tell, and a spirited message and joyful, loving, vibrant community that awaits you. Tanya McKinnon. Woo! Way to go. All right. That was fabulous. Woo! Watch out, Katy Perry. We got Tanya. Woo! Oh, my. What perfect words for this morning. I mean, you know, talk about looking through. What lens are you work, looking through? Are you looking through the plastic bag lens or the fireworks where your life goes boom? I better not sing it. But you know how it goes boom. <laughs> That was great. I, I can't repeat that, but it, it was the perfect song. You know, it's a thin line, or, or it's just, you got the spark, you got the fireworks going on. I mean, it comes down to your choice of what lens you're putting in there. I, I was going to call and say, what slide are you looking through? When I wrote this, I was going to say, you spot it, you got it. And I thought it was, uh, yeah, that was simpler, but that one's a little bit metaphorically more creative. I mean, it's like, remember in the old days when you used to have overhead projectors before PowerPoint? You would just change the slide. You're like, boom, there you go. Boom, there you go. And now we got PowerPoint. I mean, I don't, but you know, (laughs) most of you do at this point in in your life. And that's how easy it can be. You know, you've got this infinite power of life, this infinite expression of spirit that is seeking to, to move into your life, but it moves through your consciousness. It moves through your field of awareness and shows up as you choose. And if all of a sudden you're creating the difficulties or challenges or you're stuck in a particular perspective, then sometimes someone or something will come and just shake it a little bit so you can Say, you know, maybe I want to change here. I mean, as, as parents, sometimes we see our children in a certain way, and they mature and grow. We don't see them in a new kind of way. And, and I, I love the story of a family that was out uh, having dinner one night, and the waitress took everybody's order and turned to the you know, seven-year-old boy and said, what would you like for dinner? And he said, I'll have a hot dog, please. And mom quickly interrupted and said, no, I don't think so. You'll have meatloaf, smashed potatoes, and carrots. And uh, the waitress looked at the little boy and said, would you like ketchup or mustard with your hot dog? (laughs) He said, ketchup, please. And she turned to go off to the kitchen. The rest of the table was like stunned silence. You know, the little boy looked around just with glee, just, hey, she thinks I'm real. She thinks I'm real. She thinks I'm here. You know, there's something that happens in life that will all of a sudden catch us off guard and say, you know what? Maybe it is time to change the lens I've been looking through. There's something that has shifted in my world that's not the way it has been or the way it was. I mean, Mary Ann Williamson put it pretty simply and clearly when when she said that you can always perceive things differently. Like, hello? That that one's pretty simple. You can always perceive things differently. That's it. She said that you can either see uh, what's wrong with your life or see what's good with it. Pretty simple. Yeah, I mean, that's how simple it can be. I mean, do you know anyone who's always like seeing what's wrong or looking what could go wrong? Or, hey, yeah, yeah, I think we all do. Or, or those who just think life's wonderful and, and they're an uplift. And, but the thing I've noticed is everybody's trying to convince you of what they're seeing. Look through my lens, right? Hey, let's see the world as I see it. This is the correct way. And... and just, you just listen to me, and you'll have it right. Yeah, yeah, we get fixated. And the thing when we get fixated through a particular lens or slide in our life is um, that, that we close down to the other possibilities. And, you know, wisdom is being open to seeing what is beyond what you're presently seeing. You know, the mature mind is able to see the multiplicity, able to see and appreciate the paradox, able to be involved with creative uh, differences and not get upset or riled over it. And when you get fixated, which I've been told I get sometimes, and I think they're wrong, but... um, 
They said, Christian, that is just a ridiculous thing to really be stuck on. I said, no, it's not. You've got to see it through my way of thinking. But what I've noticed is that it agitates people. It irritates them. It, you know, and, and when I do that, I notice it also creates suffering inside me because that's not what I'm looking to do. But when we get fixated, it can irritate people and it makes suffering happen inside of the one that's holding on to that position. But enlightenment is being able to be comfortable enough to see beyond where it is that you have been, to be able to go into a meditative place and to recognize that there are other options. I mean, mass chess players like a Steve White or an Edwin Robinson. They can see multiple, multiplicity and many different moves at the same time. When you're in that state, you're able to, in that meditative state anyway, you're able to say, hey, this is what I'm clinging on to. This is the lens or the slide I'm looking at life at right now. And you know what? I can choose to let go of it. You know, I can see this is what I'm holding on to. I can have this mountaintop perspective on what it is I, where I'm stuck. But I realize I've got choice. I've I've done enough counseling with relationships or couples or or individuals trying to get out of a bad business situation where um, they're they're stuck. And and possibly it's it's not the right one. It's abusive. The things that are being said are nasty or not right or taking advantage. Whatever the situation is. And the people stay in that relationship or in the work or whatever business uh, situation that is no longer serving them. And finally, when they get out of it, they're like angry with God. It's like, God, why did you leave me in there so long? And I want to point out, God didn't leave you in there so long. It's Spirit is the one that is giving you other lenses to look through. Spirit is the one that said, make that phone call to realize how stuck you are in, in this particular spot. But we don't move because of fear. How am I going to support myself? What is it I'm going to do? I don't understand what it's going to look like. You may not know what it's going to look like, but you've got to trust. You've got to realize that there's another uh, slide to have the light move through in your life. But when you get into the fear, the anxiety about it, what biology tells us is physiologically we lose the peripheral sight and we get tunnel vision. When you, ha- when you got upset, you get the tunnel vision and you lose the peripheral, which is a real good survival technique. It works real well if you're a lion being pursued or if you're a deer being pursued by a lion. You know, it doesn't make much sense to like enjoy the scenery. You just don't have time to enjoy uh, the woods in that moment. You've got to get to a safe place. It had its place at a particular time. But what happens is it begins to shut us down um, physiologically, uh, psychologically, and we begin to lose the peripheral of other options. And we see very few choices when we're stuck in the fear or the distress and, um, and sometimes we see none, which is why individuals will stay in precarious situations that don't serve them in their life. It's like there are no other slides to put in there. Um, I've got a 16-year-old son who um, allows me the opportunity to watch a lot more James Bond than I would otherwise <laughs> in, in, in my life. But the thing with James Bond is he's so cool. And it's not like I'm learning to walk with more swagger. What, what I'm learning is, is that he is uh, able in the most precarious and tough, life-threatening situations where there are no options, stay cool enough that he can see options. He can think about blowing holes in walls with air tanks or, or jumping into a car that turns into a submarine or riding a motorcycle across the top of the roofs or, or jumping from trams in the sky, like things I would never think of. But... <laughs> Now I do. Hey. <laughs> agent for hire. <laughs> I'm an agent for God. <laughs> With infinite possibilities. For you. But when we can not allow the distraught to close down our peripheral view, there begins to be you know, a lot more options. We live in the multiplicity of opportunities in our life. And what is important is for us to realize there is a choice of a lens that we can always perceive differently, as Marianne Williamson says. And, and sometimes we get stuck. And one of the areas I, I, I don't know if stuck is the right word, but I'm 
close to. <laughs> um, it, it has to do with, with my son. Uh, you know, he's 16, and as I've shared with you, he's on the autistic spectrum. He's kind of in the middle. He's not high-functioning where you know he's going to go out in the world and live on his own. He's not low-functioning. He's just kind of in the middle, doesn't quite have the life skills, and you know, starting to think what's going to happen you know, when he turns 18 and, and when he gets a, a little older and he doesn't have that. And I, I'd love nothing more. I mean, my dream for him is to find his life made, a partner, fall in love, and live happily ever doing what it is he loves to do at work. But I've also recognized that his, um, his functionality in the world isn't quite there where he can go out there and, and be safe. Or, and, um, and so, you know, I, I, I believe that, you know what, in our home there will always be a place for Trevor to live. You know, my grandparents, uh, European, you know, and they, they take care of the family. Both my grandparents died in the home, parents died in the home. It's just like that's what you do. And so there will always be a space for Trevor. And then last night Kelly and I watched a, a beautiful movie. It's called uh, Life Animated. And I, it's a documentary. And Tina, you first shared that, you know, with me about a 23-year-old autistic child who's on the autistic spectrum um, stepping out into life life and the way in which he communicated his emotions because emotions are, don't work necessarily in the logical mind was through Disney movies and what I learned from watching this movie last night is that you know for a 23 year old he doesn't really want to stay in the house with mom and dad when he's a young man what they really want to do is go out there in the world like any other 23 year old and uh, find work and whether it's at the movie theater or whether it's bagging at the grocery store and all of a sudden you know, my protective father uh, you know, keeping him from wanting to fail or to get hurt I realized you know what he's got to have a broken heart and maybe stumble along the line and not get the job when he applies and all those things I want to protect him from because you know what in uh, I don't know so many years Kelly and I aren't going to be on this planet and he has no siblings and all he has is you guys and I you know we're all going to be older in 25 or 30 years and and so all of a sudden I have this fixed position I'm going to take care of my son because that's love and that's the right thing what I get to realize is there may be another possibility. And what I want us to get is there's always another lens beyond our fixed position as to the way we think it should be. And as I begin to acquiesce to something new and a greater possibility, I can get out of trying to hold my place and be a little bit more content with life. And the thing about being content in life is that it can only happen now. Contentment is only now. So many people are thinking, you know, contentment is just right around the corner. It's always right around the corner. As long as you're thinking it's going to be around the corner, it's always going to be just around the corner. When you get around the corner, it's always going to be around that next corner. But if I realize that contentment is now, when I come to recognize this contentment is now, when I go around the next corner, the contentment is now. It's happening now. And I'm going to choose to live to be happy. And I'm going to choose to express myself with a sense of contentment and joy. And what I've recognized is not everybody appreciates your contentment and joy and happiness. Have you noticed that? Like there's some individuals that get bugged by this uh, happiness kind of syndrome you got going on. And I'm just kind of a happy-go-lucky, smiling kind of person wherever I am, filled with enthusiasm, showing up and saying, hey, what a great day and I can remember walking into this one uh, office and the secretary looked up and said may I help you and I just thought man it is a great day yes you can she just looked at me and said what the hell are you so happy about (laughs) and it's like in that instant want to transfer their their lens their slides for you to be miserable that's like I don't do that (laughs) You know, I just showed something. But people always want to hand you their slide so you can be miserable, so you can see what could possibly go wrong in life. But you know what? You don't have to accept it. You just don't. And so as you begin to uh, just, just recognize, you know, what, what are the options here? I, I just share with you food for thought. And what I realize when I share food for thought, some people are on a hunger strike. And <laughs> that's okay, yeah. But the option is there to keep repeating your patterns and stay fixed or to open up to a different slide. That's possible. So you can have a different result or outcome. You know, I, do you read the story in my book, um, you know, last week, The Moose Hunters? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Susan, you did the week before. That was a good one, right? You know, but I love you guys, though, because I can use them today. Yeah, this is fun. You know how hard it is to find so many analogies week after week? You know, actually, it's very easy. It's download from Spirit. It's great. No. Um, yes. I, I, anyway, I'm going to share it with you because only a couple know it. Is that okay? 
Ryan. Okay, that's okay. Anyway, there is um, uh, this bush pilot who, uh, who was giving a couple of hunters a ride back into the Alaskan backcountry. And um, he took them back there, and they bagged their, their two big bull moose. And they, they loaded these moose up onto the plane, and the bush pilot said, You know what, guys? This is a small plane. You know, a little Cessna can only handle so much weight. You can have one moose if you want to take your gear home. You know, you, you can't have two. And the, and the two hunters said, you know what? We can have two. This is the same plane we had last time. Same size, same engine. We can have two mooses. The last bush pilot had, took us and took two moose. And so, you know, this pilot didn't want to be outdone, you know, a little ego, you know, at the pilot realm. You know, I'm not going to be, you know, stood up by the last pilot. So he acquiesced, allowed them to take the two moves. You know, the plane took off just a little ways before. It got only as high as it could, and then it crashed. And down it went. It went down. Guys were okay. No, nobody got hurt. They probably had moose to insulate their, their crash. Yeah. <laughs> The pilot got out to survey the damage to the plane. Two hunters got out, and one of them looked at the other and, and said, Do you know where we are? And his buddy said, No, don't know. But I would guess it's pretty close to where we went down last time. <laughs> How often do you have to repeat your lessons before you get it? How many? Five? No, you don't need to go five. Yeah. How often do you need to have this wake-up call that says, you know, you need to pay attention here. You need to take a look and see what is going on in your life because what may have served you for a while might not be serving you any longer and you get to decide what it is you want to do about that. You know, what is it that you're going to decide to do with um, what's up for you? I, I, I can't tell you what that is, but there's something inside of you that says, you know what, there's other choices, and there's other possibilities. And when it goes wrong, you don't have to go, whoops, you go, ah, oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's kind of fascinating stuff there. I, I, I get it. I can see. I can learn from that. Um, it's, uh, th- there was um, uh, the, the school teacher shares a story about her young class, and uh, one morning she asked the classroom, um, you know, who had breakfast this morning? And she noticed half the class, class said they had breakfast, the other class, half the class said they didn't have breakfast. And so she asked the ones that didn't have breakfast, why didn't you have breakfast? And, you know, most of them said, well, I, I got up late, or um, I just didn't have time. Some of them didn't like what was being served. All of them answered but one kid. So the teacher kind of focused in on the one child that said, you know, why didn't you have breakfast? And he said, well, because there wasn't enough. I said, what? He said, yeah, I'm one of five kids, and we don't have a lot of money, and so we only have enough money to buy breakfast, so only some of us can eat every day, and today it just wasn't my turn. I was like, wow, that's tough. And all of a sudden, when we hear things in our life that just hit us hard, I realize I don't have to stay with that image and picture. I can be courageous enough to say, you know what? It's not okay for any of the children within our country or any country to go hungry. You know what? I am not going to hold the slide where our children are suffering, but I'm going to care enough. I'm going to be courageous enough. We've got to be courageous enough to speak the truth, the spiritual truth, or put in a new slide when we're being told things that just don't resonate with that which feels right in my heart and soul. When we take a look at the world that is plagued with war, to be able to put in a new slide and say, you know what? The energy that's being spent on war, I, I know, is going to now be spent on creative resolution to what is going on in the world world. I'm going to choose in this time of presidential election, not stand and say there's no good choices, but I know that the perfect outcome is what is unfolding right now within our country. I am not going to be bamboozled into thinking this is the only option. I'm going to pull the James Bond and realize that there's something beyond what it is that I am seeing right now, that I'm living in the multiplicity of expression of the universe and like the multifacets of a doctor.
diamond that there is a light that is coming through all the different facets and there's possibilities in which I can choose and that I'm not going to get stuck and make individuals wrong but begin to say, you know what, there's, a, there's an answer here. There's something here that supports a diversity of perspective of the different races, the different creeds, the different tribes, the different clans, the different orientations. There's something that I can do about this. I'm not going to just sit back, but I am going to start by putting in a new slide and be moved by that. I mean, not this Saturday, but next Saturday, join me. I'm down at Pride Day at Oceanside, the beach. Seaside has a booth. You know, it's like, what is it that you can do and yet not add combative uh, energy to a collective slide that so many people are believing because the media says it's so, because those of authority say it's so. I want you to know that you have a higher authority and it is a divine download that is directly to you and it's your responsibility to put that in front of that light that will take on the shape and the color and the expression of your choice and that the diversity is about experiencing the richness, the multifaceted expression of the universe that is available to us. You... And so when you change that slide, it's not a matter of just sitting back. You know, it's, it, um, you know I, I like what the Buddhists teach their children. They, they teach them through fables and stories like all of us. But I mean, a couple of the stories are, are great. They, they talk about uh, the Buddha showing up as a prince or an animal. And so one of the stories is about uh, the young Buddha to be showing up as the banyan dear nobly uh, bowing before the human king and offering his life instead of the pregnant doe so she could be released and live and to have her child. And the king was so moved by this noble expression of this banyan deer that he posted throughout the kingdom that there was no more hunting deer. That is what can happen when you begin to take a stand. Another one of the stories they share with their children of the Buddha-to-be was born as a little parrot who was in the forest when a huge forest fire broke out and all of his friends of animals were getting caught in the fire. And what this little parrot could do was dive into the river, fill its wings with water and shake off the water on his friends so they couldn't get burnt. And it would dive down in the water again and shake off the little bit of water he had on his friends so they wouldn't burn in the fire. And the god of rain was so moved that it cried and put out the huge forest fire. You know... You've got to be willing to take a stand. And spirit moves in. And sometimes we just don't see the new slide or the new possibility because we're fixed or we, we have our position. You know, we're, we're told that you know, we have eyes, but we don't see. We have ears, but we don't hear. You know, we get caught up in our human experience that it makes it difficult for us to see that the other options that are there that are outside my human knowledge or possibility and what I'm truly needing is that divine download in that moment, but I'm caught up in my pain that there isn't room. I'm caught up in my fear that my peripheral vision has begun to shrink. All of a sudden, I, I'm, I'm in this place that is incapacitated, listening to the authorities who are taking me down a road that I'm not wanting to go when there are multiple facets of possibilities available, which is why we encourage people to talk to spiritual practitioners. You know, to go to a spiritual practitioner, and today is our, our prayer wall Sunday, we have practitioners and ministers that are available after service. We're going to stand up here and you come and say, hey, I could use some prayer. I am stuck in this human experience. Now, it is real. You know, you may say it's an illusion, but I'm telling you, it's real. You know, the, the pain is there. And these are the individuals that are able to know that there is a higher way of seeing things because our thoughts are not God's thoughts. What I want is the divine thought to fill my field of awareness, my purview, and my periphery, so I begin to see that, you know what, I can blow through these walls. I can ride across the rooftops. I can dive into the ocean and know that I can breathe. You know, the possibilities are infinite when I'm, really, when I'm willing to say, okay, I'm open and available and quiet my mind from my fixed position and say, okay, Spirit, show me something here. So I'm available. I'm letting go. I, I, I'm available. Show me. And we do our prayers. We call them spiritual mind treatments. You know, it's like a treatment in the realm of mind. It's spiritual mind treatment. And, and when, I, when I do and then the healing happens, I want you to know I, I don't hear spirit speaking. Like 99% of the time, I don't hear the big booming voice. This is what you need to say and believe, Christian. But what I get is a sense. You know, there, there's a feeling. There's this intuitive, ah, oh, yeah, it's just, it just feels right. There's a click inside me. It's like a weight is lifted from my shoulders. And just, wow, I can breathe. You know, it's better. 
And what I recognize is that consciousness is what will house itself. Form follows consciousness. It's this expand, you know, it's like this the spiritual download. It, it's, um, it, it's the discernment of spirit in the, in the realm of form. It's what traditional realms might call the descent of the Holy Spirit, if you would, or the Holy Ghost, what we would call an expanded uh, consciousness. A spiritual awareness begins to fill that realize that, you know, I'm not my body. I'm not the situation. Who I am is moving through the situation. Who I am is what animates this body. Your body responds to you. Right? Not part of your body, your totality, your physical bag of bones operates within your field of consciousness and every cell, every tissue, every organ responds to you. That's what it does. You look at your hand. It's not going anywhere until I tell it. Move. Right? You know, unless I'm talking, then who knows what it's doing. But, you know, <clears throat> it responds. Your body responds to your consciousness. What kind of consciousness or lens or slide are you putting there? You get to decide. Am I going to look for what's not working and grumble and tell people about that? Or am I going to look and see what's right and tell people of the possibilities? I mean, you don't have to, you don't need, you can't fool anybody. People know, you know, really what's coming out of you. Even if you mix it up a few times, you know. You know people really know your, your essence. And so I want us to get that you can change this slide. Did you see this uh, uh, YouTube this week. Steve, would you run this? It went viral this last week. Yeah. It's called I Am Ugly is what it's called. My dark circles are literally too dark to put concealer on. Cool. My lips are literally so small. And my nose is so big. And my eyebrows are so bushy. What else is wrong with me, Rachel? What? I'm you when you were little. You said my dark circles were too dark, my nose was too big, my lips were too small, and my eyebrows were too bushy. What else is wrong with me, Rachel? There's nothing wrong with you. No, go ahead, Rachel. Tell me everything you hate about me. No, I'm not going to do that. That's exactly what you're doing to yourself right now. Tell me my stretch marks are ugly. No, I can't. What do you think about the scar near my eye? What do you think about my hairy arms or my ugly feet? They're beautiful. You're beautiful. Then why can't you say that to yourself? Yes. You know, the choice is yours. You know, there, there's part of you that's never been sullied. You know, Ernest Holmes says there's part of you that has never been violated. And though the world has offered you slides of why you're not worthy or why you're not perfect or why you're not good enough, you've got that part of you that says you are beautiful, that you do have a gift, that there is nothing you need to fix you're not a black hole that needs to be filled. You're a light that needs to be shined. I think I want to end this morning with a line that all of our kids that were raised on Dr. Seuss knows. And it is, uh, today was a good day. It was fun. And tomorrow is another one. Let's say that together. Today is a good day. It, it was fun. And tomorrow is another one. Today is a good day. It was fun. Tomorrow is another one. One more time. Today was a good day. It was fun. And tomorrow is another one. Boy, life's looking good. God bless you. I love you.
you cry for mercy and you long for grace. Feel the love, feel the light. Won't you come in from the cold? Cause all the welcome here. Feel the joy, feel the peace, and the comfort of home. Cause all the welcome here. Yes, all. from the album Path of Light, was co-written by Peggy Lebo and Rev. Christian Sorensen. It's available at www.peggylebo.com.